Hi, I'm Rich Hoffman of the State Sovereignty Committee of the Liberty Township Tea Party. My colleagues and I would like to spend a minute with you to explain the Tenth Amendment and how it relates to you in relation to the U.S. Constitution. Since the vote of the health care bill, there has been a lot of discussion about state sovereignty and more specifically about the Tenth Amendment. Well before this most recent debate over health care, a question that will certainly become a Supreme Court case, we have been looking at how and why states seem to have lost so much power to the federal government. Somehow over a long span of time, the perception that the federal government is superior in all ways to the states hey. became the established perception. Doesn't the Tenth Amendment protect us from government intrusions? Exactly. The Tenth Amendment of the Constitution states clearly and simply the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. <clears throat> the reason the health care bill and other legislation is currently being considered with this Tenth Amendment issue is because the legislation is, by the wording of this amendment, a direct violation. But the Obama administration was prepared for that argument, and they are prepared to make their case. After all, this is the case with many rulings that have infringed on state sovereignty over the years. Challenging the ruling is expensive and difficult, and most of the time, we're all guilty of looking to the federal government with our hands out, which is how they get you. The purpose of this presentation is to explain, based on our research, how this transfer of rights and power has occurred, and why politicians for well over 100 years have exploited our complacency to wrestle away uh, power away from the state governments where it is more manageable for people to have control over their destinies. The sum of what we report to you is that, sadly, lawyers have been very creative in interpreting certain clauses surrounding the Tenth Amendment, like most of the Constitution. And because the language used is too complicated for the common everyday person, it leaves the interpretation of those laws to specialists. And this is the source of the problem. Hey, tell them about the CRS report. Exactly, right. The primary document we studied was a CRS report for Congress called Federalism, State Sovereignty, and the Constitution, Basis and Limits of Congressional Power. The purpose of this document is to explain to Congress what is constitutionally permissible to exercise federal powers. What we found is there are three ways, three main ways the federal government has found to impose its will on the states. They are the Commerce Clause which the Obama administration has already used as a talking point to support the validity of health care passage. The Commerce Clause uh, provides that Congress shall have the power to regulate uh, commerce with foreign nations and among the various states. This clause is the primary justification used for a significant portion of the laws passed by Congress over the last 50 years, and, is currently, and it currently represents one of the broadest bases for the exercise of congressional power. In United States versus Lopez, 514, 1995, this was the first United States Supreme Court case since the Great Depression to set limits to Congress's power under the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution. The basis of the argument was that the 12th grade, a 12th grade student had been confronted by school officials for carrying a 38 caliber pistol on the school grounds, and this was in violation of the Gun-Free School Zones Act of 1990. The Supreme Court ruled in a 5-4 decision that it affirmed the decision of the Court of Appeals in the case. It held that while Congress had broad lawmaking authority under the Commerce Clause, the power was limited and did not extend so far from commerce as to authorize the regulation of the carrying of handguns, that especially confusing. when there was no evidence that Does the carrying that of handguns that, uh, affected Congress the economy or mass Congress actually tried to use the Commerce Law to create laws against guns? That's exactly. That's exactly what it means. That's exactly what happened. The reason we're spending more time on this clause is that most congressional views comes most often under this clause. And unless someone is willing to challenge the ruling, an act by Congress will stand until it is heard and tested by the Supreme Court. This ruling shows just how far-reaching the, the, the Commerce Clause is interpreted. Clever attorneys have found many ways to twist the language to fit whatever intent they desire. Under the Commerce Clause, anything connected to commerce is affected. People, highways, 
restaurants, anything that supports the infrastructure of highways. So this is without a doubt the most abused clause that has, had, has caused the most corruption of the original constitutional intent. Another way that Congress can exercise federal power is under the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was written in 1868 to deal with issues arising from the Civil War Reconstruction Act. Congress has figured out that it can use this amendment to address issues such as voting rights and police brutality. In the case of Oregon versus Mitchell, the Supreme Court struck down a requirement that the voting age be lowered to 18 for state elections. In prohibiting Congress from dictating the voting age for state elections, a splintered court appears to have supported Congress's power to pass laws that protect 14th Amendment rights against state intrusions, but rejected the ability of Congress to extend the substantive content of those rights, as 18-year-olds are not a protected class under the 14th Amendment. The court found that Congress was attempting to create powers rather than protect 14th Amendment rights. That's an awful lot of words up there. That is an awful lot of words up there. A lot of words. And probably not intended to be used the way it has been used today, where attorneys study for many years how to twist those words to suit their needs and not the original intent. The last big clause used is the spending clause, which allows the federal government to influence state behavior despite constitutional limits by the receipt of federal monies by the states. This clause basically says that if you take money from the federal government, then you have to do what they say upon the condition of taking that money. In the Supreme Court case of South Dakota versus Dole, Congress enacted the National Minimum Drinking Age Amendment of 1984, uh, which directed the Secretary of Transportation to withhold a percentage of federal highway funds from states in which the age for purchase of alcohol was below 21 years. The state of South Dakota, which permitted 19-year-olds to purchase beer, brought suit arguing that the law was an invalid exercise of Congress's power to the spending clause to provide for the general welfare. The Supreme Court held that as the indirect imposition of such a standard was directed toward the general welfare of the country, it was a valid exercise of Congress's spending power. As shown through this, through this congressional report, a lot of time and energy is spent finding ways to manipulate the Tenth Amendment in order to impose federal mandates. And the next big case will be the health care issue. By studying the case law of several Tenth Amendment cases over the, over, uh, over the last 50 years, the importance of challenging this ruling is absolutely essential because without a challenge, we will find bolder attempts by the federal government to bend the rules of the Constitution to suit their selfish political agendas. And it is clear that the movement of the Tea Parties has emerged for one primary reason. Politicians that we have put in power to represent our interests have let us down. And now, many of, uh, many of the issues regarding governing the country are left to us to sort out. Because they have shown us that they cannot be trusted but must be watched vigilantly like children that will be up to mischief the moment our backs are turned. The lessons that we can take from this study is that we have to take responsibility at the local level for our constitutional given rights. We cannot let those in federal and state positions believe for a second that they are our leaders, allowed to impose their wishes upon us, but only our representatives elected to implement our wishes. And lastly, that if you accept the help of any government agency, then you surrender a portion of your freedom to their quest for social reforms. The Constitution was written with the intention to protect the people from the kind of corruption we have witnessed recently. And over the years, by empowering us to care for ourselves without the blurred lines of elitism and power grabs. If you want to make an impact, preserving your state's right, right now, look at current issues that pertain to, the federal, to federal abuse and demand your Attorney General to challenge those rulings. Consider it your duty and a part, an important part of the process needed within the realm of checks and balances to preserve and protect our free country. If you live in Ohio or know someone that does, encourage them to register for the petition signing to the health care reform, uh, health care freedom amendment. It's the top email address right up there. Check that out. It's a great website. 
It is through grassroots activity like this that you can take the first step to taking back what is already yours, the government. Thank you very much.